um, I think you've raised two very important points for discussion. Um, you've given a, an excellent overview of the transformation that's taking place in Saudi Arabia, but you've raised two very controversial uh, um, key points that uh, we will discuss later. One is this balance between job market and employability-driven accreditation versus the academic assessment, and I think our previous speakers have also alluded to that, and the accreditation and ranking. So uh, we'll come back to this. Uh, all 68 uh, institutions will have very strong point of views uh, about these uh, two, two points. But now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Pedro Tixiera. Dr. Pedro is the director of the Center for Research and Higher Education Policies and professor at the Faculty of Economic, of Economic at the University of Porto. Dr. Pedro is, uh, has served as an advisor on higher education and science to the president of Portugal, and he was the vice rector for academic affairs at the University of Porto and was also a member of Portugal's National Council of Education. Dr. Pedro served on the evaluation panels for the European University Association, the European Association for Quality Assurance in Higher Education. He's also a member at the Consortium of Higher Education Researchers and a research fellow at the Institute for the Study of Labor. Today, Dr. Pedro is talking about diversity and differentiation in higher education. Uh, welcome, Dr. Pedro, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and it is really a pleasure for me to participate. I'm very grateful for the invitation and for the opportunity to share with you some of the work. I hope that you are listening to me. Uh, the listening is okay. It's clear. Very okay, clear. thank you very much. And I will now do the presentation. So um, what I'm trying to do, I, I probably will not go into the in some of the slides, but I, I, will, I will share them with you. So, and and you'll have my contact at the end. So, in case you are interested in some of the aspects or you want to discuss further, if we don't have time, and then in the session, then I'll be happy to be contacted. Um, but what I, I'll try to share with you in the the minutes that I, the few minutes that I have, um, is uh, the result of uh, of uh, a joint ex experience. Uh, that, uh, that I find that is very useful and very interesting, um, which is on the one hand, I've, I've been interested for many years in the, the changes in the landscape in higher education and with the emergence of private providers and the multiple combinations of public and private providers in higher education. Um, and at the same time, uh, I've been involved, as you've mentioned, uh, for many years in the uh, review and evaluation of uh, universities uh, and quite a few of private universities and also the review of uh, systems of quality assurance that have to deal both with public and private providers and um, and i think for me one of the aspects that has been very interesting in bringing together these two experiences is uh, how to address the issue of diversity in higher education so for a long time we discuss the have been discussing in in higher education the importance of having you know, a, a more diverse supply. Uh, one of the things that I think one of the rationales that is, I think, very central to the discussion that we're having today and that is related to some of the things that my colleagues in the panel have already presented is that you want to um, encourage the articulation between higher education and society, higher education and the labor market. You want institutions to be responsive to the needs of society in, in many different ways. So you want to encourage uh, institutions to uh, find different paths, different ways, different approaches to uh, fulfill and satisfy those needs. And, and there is a, a, a long-standing debate in higher education about how to encourage uh, this, how to encourage greater diversity in, in higher education, and the expectation also that uh, by the emergence of private higher education that this would contribute to better to a wider choice among students and also among employers regarding the profiles of, of graduates. Um, one of the things that, that, that I've, I've also found interesting is that in a lot of the literature that you we have uh, more academic literature in, in diversity in higher education, quite often diversity is seen as a tool in itself, as an end in itself and not so much as an instrument. And, and in previous work, I was interested in trying to assess not only diversity for its own sake, but also the impact of this diversity 
through several ways. So not only in terms of program diversity, which is probably the, the central aspect of discussion today, but also in the, the even the impact in terms of the learning outcomes can, can be operated not only in terms of the profile of the program, but in different ways. In the profile, for instance, of the academic staff that can have an impact in terms of the learning outcomes, in the delivery process, and of course, one of the things that has become more uh, crucial in recent uh, months is distance learning, but this has been around for, for many years. So there are many ways in which, through which higher education institutions can promote this diversity. And, and as I mentioned, there was this expectation that private uh, providers would uh, bring greater diversity to the system. And in initial uh, research that I've done with colleagues uh, some years ago, we start finding that actually the, the results were, were a bit contradictory to these expectations. So we found that um, quite often in many countries, private education behave in a way that was trying to emulate what was the behavior of public institutions that were more longly um, established and, and that therefore uh, in a way to build um, a reputation, they would tend to emulate uh, providers that already exist in the system. Also because of competition, they tended to um, imitate and to uh, produce programs that were successful. Um, so we, we found less diversity than expected and, and that public and private systems, instead of being um, complementary to each other, they ended quite often to overlap, quite often in terms of regions, in terms of types of programs. Uh, and so for us, it, it has been interesting and we've, we've been trying to explore uh, how really how different and how similar public and private systems, how much do they contribute to this diversity and to a diverse system of higher education. So what I will present just briefly is an overview of uh, the patterns that we found in, uh, in higher education. In many ways, the patterns that I will identify here uh, can be found in other uh, regions, but I, I will just um, uh, highlight results from European higher education uh, because the ones that I know better in terms of the, the empirical data and because I've participated in also in several comparative projects that looked at, uh, uh, that tried to, uh, to build a database of uh, European higher education institutions. So the questions that I was interested in when I explored this data was, you know, really how different are public and private institutions, you know, how much are they specialized or comprehensive, uh, which, in which areas do they tend to specialize if they specialize, um, how much, uh, how is the balance between different missions, namely between education, teaching and research? And what about the geographical coverage of the, both uh, public and private higher education? And, and one of the things that we immediately we find when we look at the, 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 these two sectors in many systems is that uh, normally public institutions tend to be larger than on average than private institutions. And that has a, 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 a quite a, a logical implication in terms of the profile. So public institutions tend to be more comprehensive. They tend to focus on different levels of education, um, different, different levels of higher education, meaning bachelor, master, and PhD. So they tend to cover the full uh, range of programs. They also tend to cover more disciplines. And whereas private institutions tend to be smaller on average, they tend to be more specialized and they also quite often tend to focus on the first level, the first cycle, let's say the bachelor degree, uh, sometimes master level, but much less in terms of the doctoral level. Um, and when we look in terms of the regional, uh, the, the, the geographical coverage of the regional diversification, you see on your uh, left-hand side, the coverage in terms of public institutions across Europe, and then on your right-hand side, the coverage in terms terms of private institutions. And I think, you know, visually immediately you see that, uh, that whereas in the public sector, um, the public sector tends to cover almost all regions. So in all regions, you will find um, public supply of higher education. In many countries, we see that the private sector has a much more concentrated pattern in terms of its geographical coverage. And this pattern of concentration is also when we look in terms of the number of educational fields and using the, the sort of the, the traditional uh, distribution by um, educational fields, we see that on average, um, public institutions in Europe tend to cover um, 
if not all the, the areas, most of the areas. So in, in many systems, on average, public institutions cover seven out of eight uh, or six out of eight uh, education fields. So they tend to be more generalist institutions, whereas the private institutions tend to be much more specialized. On average, quite often they cover, they cover only one or two of these large educational fields than, that we normally use in international comparisons. And uh, when we try to systematize this, and especially when we try to capture this degree of specialization by the size of the institutions, by their enrollments, we see that uh, for systems that have sizable public and private uh, higher education system, the uh, sector, sorry, uh, in their system, we see that the private sector really is really much more um, uh, concentrated, much more specialized, much less diverse than the private sector, uh, than the public sector, sorry. And that means that, you know, that we're talking about two sectors that have different profiles and different challenges. Um, so I, I will not uh, um, uh, highlight uh, more than what I've just said. Uh, one of the things that is also very important is that the profile in terms of uh, areas of specialization is also very specific in the private sector. The private sector tends to be much more uh, focused on social science, business law, and much less in terms of um, science, engineering, and humanities. So the private sector is much more specialized in areas that have strong demand, strong student demand, and strong labor market demand, and tends to uh, avoid those, those um, educational sectors that are, or those educational fields that are more expensive, that are more risky, uh, and where the demand is also uh, smaller. And the other thing that I think is also important when we discuss about uh, accreditation quality assurance um, in this you know, combined public-private uh, systems is that um, the profile is also different. As I said, the emphasis in terms of, uh, of the private sector is much more in terms of teaching and education and much less in terms of research. This also is related to the, pro to the disciplinary profile. So quite often they are, the, the emphasis in law, business, economics, management, uh, social science, where the research intensity, where the resources allocated to research, the visibility of research, it's much smaller than if we go to hard sciences, to technological areas or to the health sciences. Um, but also has to do with the profile of their staff. So quite often in private institutions, we find a much stronger presence of part-time staff, um, either because they, they share their time between public and private institutions, but also they share their time between um, their contribution to universities and their professional activities. Quite often this, explicit, this is explicitly uh, intended by private institutions because they want to strengthen the link with professional activity, with practice, with the labor market. But this also means that this quite often is a, a professional, um, is an academic staff that is less qualified in terms of academic degrees. So a, a lower share of academic staff with a PhD and also that their engagement with institutions, especially with research activities is also much smaller. So we have a profile of institutions that is, is clearly different between the public and private sector. Of course, some of these has, has to do with the average size of the institutions in the public and the private sector. Some of these has to do with the level of maturity of the private sector that is much smaller. So one would, could say that, well, once the private sector becomes more consolidated, probably also build a more uh, significant uh, presence in terms of research. But what we We have seen a um, uh, system sector is that still there is a different profile that persists. So um, in the time that I have left it, I think I only have a few minutes left. I would like really to, to draw the implications of these in terms of quality assurance. I, I, I really don't want to um, provide answers. I, 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 I'm much more concerned in terms of raising issues based on the experience that I've had uh, in discussing this with universities, discussing with this uh, with uh, uh, agencies dealing with this, and especially 
the, the, the big challenge is, you know, on the one hand, if you look at the declarations of uh, policymakers, of uh, leaders of institutions, leaders of agencies, quite often they emphasize the importance of diversity in higher education. But the problem is how to draw the implications of this and how to be consequential with this when you look at, uh, uh, at the way quality assurance and accreditation is implemented. And, and, and one of the things that I think it's important to discuss is what types of diversity do you want to encourage? What types of diversity do you think there is important to exist in higher education? Um, how much do you want to encourage program diversity? How much do you encourage diversity in terms of curriculum? How much do you want to encourage diversity in terms of the professional versus more academic emphasis, even in the same discipline? So um, the question of it's not so much the differences between di disciplines, but also even in each discipline, let's say in engineering, in economics, in, in health, um, in law, you may have programs, you may have a coexistence of programs that have more, uh, they're more academically oriented and programs that are more professional oriented. This may result because of the, the profile of the program, the profile of the academic staff uh, uh, teaching uh, the program is different. How much, how much freedom do you want to allow the institutions to do this? Um, how much do you want to allow programs to exist in institutions that have a very limited engagement in terms of research? What are the risks of allowing this? But at the same time, or looking on the other side, how much can you impose an emphasis on research, especially in fundamental research, in institutions that are very much dependent on the tuition fees paid by the students? How much, in, in, in many ways, in many cases, those private institutions are not entitled or are not competitive to access research funding. So it will be very difficult for them to have a strong presence and a strong commitment to research. Um, the, the, the financial viability of having a permanent staff will be questionable in many of these cases because of the size of the institution. It won't be viable. So where do you want to draw the line between what is acceptable and what is not acceptable in terms of research? Um, and how much do you want to emphasize a balance between fundamental research and applied research, both in public and in private institutions? So the question that I'm, I'm raising that I think is, is a big challenge for many um, uh, program evaluation, for many um, uh, accreditation systems is, how do you allow, how do you combine the, the diversity that you want to encourage with the consistency? Because at the same time, the sort of the other argument will be, well, um, you want families and students and employers to trust the system. And the, the way private sector has developed in many systems has not been particularly favorable to enforce, to consolidate that trust. Though there is a perception in many systems that the expansion of the private sector was very much focused in absorbing demand, in expanding very rapidly without significant concerns with quality. So how do you want to use accreditation quality assurance to ensure that everyone fulfills a minimum standard everyone attains a level of um, uh, consistency and credibility from academic and educational point of view and satisfy minimum criteria, but at the same time, in a way that does not constrain the diversity of system and does not leave, uh, lead to a degree of uh, homogenization in the system that prevents the diversity that you want to encourage. And so, and this means that we need to move from sort of generic statements about diversity in the system and to infuse the process of accreditation in terms of what you ask uh, institutions to fulfill in terms of the forms. What are your concerns when you review programs and when you review institutions? How do you compose the panels? Uh, for instance, by including professionals or people with professional expertise that can value and then can assess adequately the contribution of institutions that have a stronger professional accreditation, uh, professional uh, orientation. Um, how much do you accommodate the, the, in terms of criteria, these different profiles of institutions, these different missions, these different emphases or balances 
between education and research. And, and how much do you accommodate this in terms of assessment? Because, well, institutions necessarily will, will expect their programs to be uh, um, fairly assessed, to be accredited, otherwise they cannot uh, be sustainable. And, and they will necessarily adjust to what is expected. So if you are not consistent between what you say in terms of diversity, but then what you do in terms of accreditation and quality assurance, then institutions will look at what you say and what, what you do. So I, 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 what my experience is that this is much more difficult to implement because, um, because quite often of the lack of trust and lack of legitimacy that um, um, private education institutions face. But that if you really want to encourage diversity in the system and diversity that is accepted and trusted by, uh, by the system, by families, by employers, by society at large, then you need to really uh, connect what you do in terms of diversity with what you do in terms of quality assurance. I think I've covered uh, most of the, 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 the material, especially I think I've exhausted the time that allocated. I've just listed some of the, 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 the main work that is works at the background for the results that I presented. I'm, I'm very grateful for the time and for your patience and, and, and I'll be happy to participate in discussion uh, if we still have time for that. Thank you very much.